In this short talk, we're going to have a look at wind, uh, specifically measurement of wind and stress and the speed stress relationship. And we'll talk a bit about how wind makes waves and what kinds of sizes of waves it makes. Shown here is a globally average wind field. These winds are driven by very large scale systems in the atmosphere. And you see here some of the main features of the the global wind system the na that have names. We, For example, we have the trade winds here sweeping across here. And we can see in each of the Pacific and Atlantic gyre we have, since we have these westerlies in the northern parts of the gyre, we have easterlies in the southern parts of the gyre, and we'll see in later segments of the class how this connects to the large scale circulation and then there are bands in both those gyres where there is very little wind. There are different direction conventions for wind. For example, we'll take a southwest wind. Now in meteorological or nautical convention they would refer to this as a southwest wind. The wind is coming from the southwest so this is different than uh, the way currents are discussed when we say, when we give the wind a name, a, a north wind or a west wind, or in this case a southwest wind. By southwest we mean coming from the southwest. In this meteorological or nautical convention, the angle measured is measured clockwise, which is not conventional, clockwise from north, from the y-axis, also not conventional. So for the case of a southwest wind, which will be blowing from the southwest towards the northeast. In this case, let me put my x and y axes, uh, axes on. The measurement of the angle is clockwise from north. So that's 225 to the tail of that arrow. North, a north wind coming from the north would be zero. A southwest wind is 225. The other convention is a traditional Cartesian convention. Again, we would still refer, refer to it as a southwest wind. In terms of measuring the angle, the direction is 2. Like, any, like a vector typically is, the direction it's pointing. The angle in this case is measured counterclockwise from the x-axis, which is east. So in that case, the angle of the southwest wind, or the wind coming some from the southwest, towards the northeast is 45. The differences are pretty significant, significant enough this can cause a lot of trouble. So when you're given, if you have to process wind data and someone gives it to you, often it will be in magnitude and direction. You want to make sure you understand which direction it's referring to. You can see the same wind can have very different directions depending on the convention. So make sure you understand what the convention is. Wind measurements, wind is a vector, so you need both speed and direction. These typical cup anemometers you see all over the place, these do not provide direction. It's just a way of essentially correlating spin rate with the magnitude of the wind. Um, so you can measure wind magnitude, but no direction. These axial anemometers have a vane on them. The vane keeps it steered into the wind. Inside here is a compass. And once calibrated, this can give direction and heading of the wind. Both pieces of information needed to construct the vector. Here we see a typical wind polar plot. There are different routines, for example, in MATLAB to take wind statistics and plot them. Often they're plotted in a from method. These are wind statistics for Buzzards Bay. Buzzards Bay in the summer has um, pretty consistent sea breeze on warm days. If there's not much cloud cover, you will have a southwest wind or wind coming from the southwest up the bay. So here's the shore of south uh, coast of Massachusetts, and here's Cape Cod. And in the armpit here is Buzzards Bay. And so you have pretty consistently in the summer wind blowing up the bay. 
and starts in the early afternoon, peaks around four o'clock, and then is diminished near dark. This is typical statistics. These are summer statistics for Buzzards Bay. You have a lot of winds coming from this con um, quadrant, from varying from south to west. Dom the dominant winds in this narrow band between south southwest and west southwest, centered on west southwest or southwest. This is a kind of histogram. It tells you uh, a directional histogram that also has information about the magnitude. You have percentage frequency of winds by magnitude, and also their bend at I think 15 degree angles in the uh, azimuthal, in the angular direction. Um, and as you can see, you have a, a, a large number of winds in the low six to eight, or four to six, six to eight range. Now these are in meters per second. A common a unit of wind speed is the knot and one knot is 0.5144 meters per second but it's pretty close to a half so you can convert meters to second to knots by multiplying by two that is not exact but it's fairly close so six meters per second is roughly 12 knots so this band of sea breeze winds is typically low teens to upper teens with some winds being on strong days being in the low 20s and that's in knots. Uh, so what does wind do as it blows over the surface of the water? Why does the water even care about the wind? In a very simple case, the wind would just blow and it might be made up of simple layers we can think of it. And this water sitting here and it feels absolutely no impact from the wind. The wind is just simply slipping over the water. And this is what we, we refer to as an inviscid, inviscid flow field. Invis the flow in reality is not inviscid. And so we can think of these molecules of air as they're moving along very close to the wall, which we made up of these blue, make it green molecules here. The molecules of air cannot slip past each other. We refer to this as the no slip boundary condition. So something's pushing this air. There's a pressure gradient in the atmosphere driving this column of air. But very near the surface of the water, things change rapidly. The velocity must equal that of the water, which we'll assume for the moment is at rest. And therefore, you have the velocity of the air being zero at the wall. If we assume that the fluid is at rest, it's zero at the wall. It is not zero up here. So that generates what we call a velocity shear. So we take these slabs, what happens is this bottom slab is now slowed down by the water and that slab will act through friction on the, ne on the next slab. This one here and this one here and this one here and ultimately this boundary condition will generate a profile like this. It's roughly a parabolic profile. In this case, what you sketched here is what's called a turbulent boundary layer profile. It goes to zero at the wall, very far from the wall, it's blowing the true wind speed, and in between there is a gradient that connects back and looks something like this. The height of the boundary layer, there's different ways to measure boundary layer height, such as momentum thickness or delta 99, but it's essentially the distance at which the wind recovers its full speed or its uniform speed. Now the shape of this boundary layer depends on a lot of factors. Stratification, uh, if the water is very cold, you have cold dense air near the surface, the wind has trouble mixing up and essentially you can have very strong winds up here and at sort of human height almost no wind at all. Humidity, has, uh, humidity plays a role, the speed of the wind, and in particular the roughness of the surface. Roughness gen tends to generate more turbulence, so this could be trees or wind waves, um, will have a large effect on the nature of that profile. It's quite complex to predict that profile, um, although there are a lot of analytical expressions that try to take these into account. The profile is important in some sense because if you make a reading of the wind, Let's say you put your anemometer out here and you say and you measure the wind here or if you decide to buy a more expensive taller pole and put it here you can see you're going to get two different readings. 
most wind readings are standardized to a 10 meter height. And by knowing the log distribution, let's say this is the 10 meter height, and you happen to measure at 6 meters, because that was the top of your house, you can use the, your best guesstimate of the distribution to convert this to a 10 meter height. So because of the layer here, it's important when you get an anemometer reading that you determine what the height was at which the instrument, uh, the height at which the, uh, the instrument is placed, because that will influence uh, how you process the data. Many measurements, as I said, are converted already to 10 meter. Some are not. For example, one very tall measurement near us is the Buzzards Bay buoy. Uh, it's a tower at the mouth of Buzzards Bay. I don't recall the height of that, but it's considerably higher than 10 meters. And very often when you look at the wind, what's happening in the regionally with the wind, you'll find that the tower is reading higher than everything else, but that is only because it is taller than everything else. Um, so if it's not standardized to 10 meter, it's best to put it at 10 meter um, for, uh, for processing. So, the, so this profile matters in the sense when you measure, you want to know where you are and keep in mind that the velocity will vary with distance from the ground. Uh, but what really matters is the stress. What does this moving air do to the surface of the water? We know already that if you blow across a cup of coffee, uh, if you're trying to cool your coffee and you blow on it, or you just blow even in a pan of water, that will move the, will move the surface water. How is it moving the surface water? Well, it's imparting a stress, a force per unit area on that surface. But it's a different kind of stress than the pressure we talked about. This is a pulling stress. It's acting in the direction uh, parallel with the surface. So if you think about a parcel of air right here um, above the water, and the air is moving, and essentially if we start in a moment before here, if we just took a picture of this square of air, it's moving faster up here than it is down here. And so this, if we were to use a laser sheet, basically, and mark the boundaries of the square at an instant, at another instant, it would have distorted like this. Now, that's because we have higher velocity here than here. But it wants to resist that distortion. It's not dissimilar. Um, it is dissimilar, but we can think of, um, as an analogy, perhaps a pan of jello. If you have, say, a four-inch thick pan or block of jello and you put your hand uh, palm on it and you put it on roller skates on a table and this is jello and you put your hand here and you push in this direction the jello will distort a bit but then it will begin to move on the roller skates it's resisting that distortion now water resists distortion or fluid resists a distortion in the sense that resists a rate of shear, a velocity shear, is resisted. And that coefficient resistance we can think of as the viscosity. A higher visco viscosity fluid will give greater resistance to a shear. Um, and this is written in the sense of a Newtonian fluid. It's, it's linearly proportional to that viscosity. A lower viscosity fluid has less resistance to shear. Because there is resistance to shear, by applying the stress here, it applies the stress here at the boundary. And so the moving fluid in the boundary layer imparts a stress at the wall. It tries to drag water along with it. This is a shear stress. So again, it acts on the face in the, and it's parallel. It lies in that face. Now there's many formulas to convert from stress to speed, and I'm going to address that in a slide. Let's just go, I just want to make this point again. If you have a block of fluid here, the shear stress acts on the face, and it's parallel to the face, it lies in the face. Whereas a normal stress, like pressure, acts normal to the face. Pressure pushes onto the block of water, and the shear stress acts on the face. Um, parallel to it. This is normal to it. That's why we call it a normal stress or orthogonal or at 90 degrees. Pressure, of course, is always in this direction. Always pushes on. Pressure is always positive, at least in the ocean. And 
So that's a key difference. These are both stresses, but they act very differently. Pressure versus what we would call a surface, uh, ocean surface or bed. So the ocean is here, and the motion of the air over that is going to part a stress on that surface. And that stress is really what we care about. It's essentially dragging the water at the surface along with it. Analogous to that, we'll talk about later in a lecture on benthic processes, as the water moves over the bed, it does the same thing and it parts a stress on the bed. That stress can lead to suspension of materials. It can pull, essentially pull sand grains out of the bed and into the water column. These stress strain, these relationships between speed of the air and stress at the surface, there's many of them. This is a very simple one you can use for simple calculations. This is essentially a drag coefficient density of the air, um, which is approximately one kilogram per meter cubed, a little bit more, and you have your U10. The 10 means 10 meter. Again, that's the standard for height measurements, and often in a stress formula, it will assume that you are giving it a velocity of 10 meters. The good algorithms like the ARC Toolbox and MATLAB will allow you to give it a velocity and uh, state where that velocity was measured and it will make the adjustment for you. Now here we're assuming a constant drag coefficient, but ultimately the drag depends on the speed of the wind because as the wind speed goes up, the wave state gets larger, and as the wave state gets larger, you get a larger effective roughness, which changes the drag coefficient. So this simple law is probably suitable for, for quick calculation, but doesn't really take into account what happens, particularly at very high wind speeds. I'll show you one of the more common formulations it's called is by Large and Pond, 1981. Again, this is programmed into the Python and MATLAB ARC toolboxes. You provided a wind speed uh, in meters per second. Here I'm plotting knots. And the anemometer height and, and possibly a density of the air, and it comes back with the wind stress. So just to give you a sense of stress, this is again a Pascal. We have one Pascal is approximately 40 knots not very well drawn there, but 40 knots. 30 knots is roughly half a pascal. And 20 knots is about 0.15 pascals. It's a, essentially a quadratic relationship, which you can sort of see here. Um, so it's good to sort of remember some of those numbers. Those are the three I like to remember. But remember some of those numbers, uh, because oftentimes you'll see data of wind stress and it's very hard to have a sense of what stress means in terms of speed. Speed is intuitive. You have you know that 100 miles an hour is a lot of wind and 2 miles an hour is not a lot of wind, but it's hard to say if, you know, 1 pascal is a lot or half a pascal because we don't even really have a sense of what a pascal is. So try to remember these and that will enable you when you look at a wind stress chart if you see 1 pascal, you know that's a pretty strong wind, 40 knots.